Hi, this is Mike Maloney with Adam Taggart. Jeff Clark is up looking at some silver mines, so he's going to be off for the next couple of weeks with these recordings. But Adam, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm a little intimidated, though. Usually in these videos, uh, you know, Jeff's the, the consummate host, and I just have to sort of sit there and look pretty and hopefully not say something too dumb. Uh, now we actually got to do some work to try to fill in Jeff's shoes as host here. But we got a lot of stuff to talk about today, Mike. So let's jump right in. Um, and folks, we got a lot here today. This is going to be a great video. We even have two excellent memes. So today you get two memes of the day for the price of one. Um, so Mike, the story for today is a video clip by uh, CNBC's Power Lunch. It's really surprisingly kind of refreshing to see mainstream media actually talk about silver and not just silver itself, but trying to make a differentiation between actual physical silver and paper silver. Now, clearly these hosts of a money show don't seem like they've actually seen actual money before. It's really funny to see the, their reaction when the, uh, the woman leading the, the segment there actually gives them a bar of silver. But, but what did you think about this? Uh, I, I agree that that was hilarious, that this uh, money show, these people don't know what money is. They see it for the first time. And at the very end, the guy says, can I short that? <laughs> Which he can. Uh, so he, he isn't treating it like money. They're sort of laughing about it at the same time. But what this shows is some of the power that the Wall Street silver movement has had, uh, because that is one of the reasons that they're all talking about they're talking and for the first time uh, we're seeing things like uh, them talking about the amount of paper claims that there uh, are against silver uh, versus the physical silver that's available so it's interesting that this information is now being disseminated disseminated through the financial channels to the average guy it's it's, it's uh, very interesting and it just shows that this is sort of the beginning you're going to at, as you know, if you were um, tuning into the news in late 1979 or January of 1980, and, and even beyond after the peak in January of 1980 of gold and silver, the news didn't, they weren't talking about stocks. They weren't talking about anything but gold and silver. It was all the news all the time. And so when we get to the top, uh, that will be what, but this shows, you know, maybe we're just entering like the second stage now people are, uh, you know, or the beginning of the third stage, but we're still very early on in the profits that are to be made in precious metals. And I just hope that the Wall Street silver community has the fortitude to stick with it and uh, not, um, you know, buy and sell their positions real quickly. Uh, you just stick through this entire precious metals bull. And if they want to do a squeeze, that's the way to do it. So they are having an effect. What's your take? Uh, well, let, let, let's hope that, uh, that you're right, Mike, and that we are beginning to sort of see the mainstreamization of precious metals. Um, there's that famous quote, I can't remember who said it, and I'm going to botch it, but it's something like, uh, first they ridicule you, then they oppose you, and then they accept what you've been saying all along as self-evident at the end, right? And maybe this yeah. is you know, one of the early baby steps on our way to it becoming accepted and eventually becoming self-evident. So I, I, I take that as really, uh, really encouraging. Um, although I, do, I did find it a little strange that uh, the, the precious metal expert that they brought on, um, Adrian Ash, who, who you know, is a good expert in his own right, but he, he made a comment that he said, silver like gold, you know, we, we don't throw it away. There's a ton of it above ground, which that's probably the only thing I would have taken exception to in that, that, that segment there is that you know, silver is, is a highly consumed uh, commercial metal. And in many ways, um, you know, we, we use it in such small amounts that it's actually irretrievable. So we're actually using up a lot of the above ground soda every year, which is why we have to keep replenishing it. And I see you nodding here, Mike. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. All right. Well, let's, so, let's build off of that and go on to the next uh, the tweet of the day, which is another video segment from CNBC, just from another uh, channel there, or another show there, uh, Fast Money this time. And uh, boy, some of the most I would say sort of positive forecasting that I've seen a mainstream channel do for silver. They're talking about uh, uh, you know, 30 plus dollar silver, uh, perhaps right by the end of August. What did you take from that? Uh, well, 
again, I just think it's amazing that it's getting mentioned on financial channels. And this is actually a very bullish sign. Uh, this uh, short-term predictions and stuff and how many uh, options there are on, you know, how many contract futures contracts or options, this stuff in the short term, I really don't care about. I, I uh, look at the long term and its ultimate destiny because I believe there is an absolute destiny for gold and silver here. And so I like to bet on the sure thing, not try and calculate where it's going to be next month or next year, but where it's going to be when it finally peaks against the stock market, against real estate, and against all of the other things that you can um, you know, sell your silver and then buy with the proceeds, because that's what counts, not where it is measured in dollars. It's how much stuff that it buys you. That way, um, you're protected. If you're thinking that way, you're excluding inflation or deflation. It doesn't matter which, which direction we go. How much more stuff are you going to be able to buy for each ounce of silver that you own? And um, uh, they sort of miss this fact. But the very fact that here on CNBC, there were two different shows that were talking about silver. I think that this is amazing. I, I don't think this has happened since the 80s. Uh, it probably hasn't. And Mike, I'm a little bit younger than you, so I wasn't really watching CNBC in the 80s. I was uh, probably watching more MTV at that point in time. Um, so it's great to have your, your perspective there. But, but not only are they, they talking about silver, they're talking positively about silver. You know, when they usually talk about precious metals on these shows, which is not very often, it's usually, you know, with a derogatory focus. And to see uh, you know, some optimism and enthusiasm there really, really, again, is refreshing. And one stat there that really caught my attention um, was right now there are 17 times more calls than puts on silver. Um, and Mike, you're wow. right to, to remind people to look at the long term here. That's the right way to do it. But it shows that the market is getting excited in the short term about silver. And one of the reasons they mentioned was because of inflation. And, and it's worth, because the new data just came out today, it's worth us talking about this for just a second. Uh, the latest CPI uh, numbers came out and they're now uh, the highest they've been since 2008, biggest surge since 2008. Uh, we printed at 5.4%, which is pretty staggering given that we've gone through you know, a decade plus of inflation down in the you know, 1.5% range. Um, so, uh, Mike, I'd love to get your reaction to that, but, it, uh, well, yeah, let me get your reaction to that. And then a couple of quick points I'll bring in. I think that, uh, this is very important to mention, and this is all the result of government meddling in this system We, we, uh, you know, with the lockdowns that we've had, which we shouldn't have had, the evidence is there. The lockdowns really don't do anything. Uh, and you know, they sacrificed the global economy. Uh, which will ultimately end up doing a lot more harm to a lot more people than, um, you know, there would have been probably slightly more uh, COVID cases and so on if, the, if people were wearing masks and social distancing, but not closing down the economy like they did in a lot of areas, increasing unemployment and, and then redistributing wealth by printing currency to, uh, uh, you know, hand out as stimulus uh, and all of the deficits, the, the consequences of their actions over the past uh, year and a half are going to extend for decades. We're going to be feeling this. Uh, but um, I also think that the Fed may be right with this transitory stuff because I've been following lumber lately, you know, um, I bought a farm that was heavily hurricane damaged and I'm having to rebuild a lot of stuff right now. And um, the lumber futures have come down to where they were two years ago. And they were up, uh, lumber had gone from like uh, 700 up to 1700, 650 up to 1700. And now it's back down to about 700. Uh, so uh, the, um, I took a look at a lot of the other commodities, corn, wheat, uh, copper, uh, and um, it looks like, you know, oil doesn't look like that, but it looks like a lot of these things could be following that trend. Uh, because of the shutdown in the economy, uh, the businesses that produce this stuff had to stop producing it. And so, you know, uh, shut down their plants. 
the, you know, it takes a while for that, the, the excess that they've got to get used up in the supply chain. And then it was used up. And then when they opened up the economy, there's all this demand and there's no supply. So now they've done their ramp up. And with lumber, the ramp up has already worked its way through the wholesale end of things. So within the next couple of months, we should see the price of, those, of, of lumber coming down at retail. Um, when it comes to food, I have noticed that like all of the cuts of steak, uh, New York's and ribeyes and, and uh, porterhouses and things like that, uh, here they're all, you know, at the supermarket that's uh, close here, uh, you've got stuff that was $12 a pound and now it's uh, $14.95. Uh, you know, it's, everything has gone up 15, 20% as far as uh, the meats. And I have noticed just my bill to fill a shopping cart has gone up tremendously. Uh, that will probably persist for a while, even if the wholesale prices of all these things like corn and wheat and so on, these, the food and beef uh, do come down uh, because I'm sure there was a period where supermarkets uh, were operating at a loss. They're going to they're not going to lower their prices until the competition starts lowering theirs. So we'll see a lag here. But I do think that inflation may come back down. But that's a maybe, a big maybe. Yeah. Well, you, know, I, you and I have talked about this on previous videos, Mike. And, and I do want to give us a little bit of a pat in the back where we have been cautioning people that a lot of the cost push inflation that's been occurring over the past two quarters was likely to be transitory. And you, lumber is the best example of that right now. Um, it, it, as of today, it's now negative on the year in terms of prices. So that massive spike yeah. that we saw um, is, has largely played out, as you said earlier. The, the only other thing to what you've said that I want to underscore here is I think what we're seeing right now really is like a preview of what's to come. So right now, everybody's looking at the high inflation numbers. And as we're seeing in the mainstream media, People are beginning to wake up that, oh, if you're worried about inflation, maybe you actually want to own some precious metals as a way to protect your wealth. Right now, as you've said, I, I, I think that a lot of the, the current spike will kind of tail off over the, the rest of this coming year as supply chains catch up and then competition is able to get prices e even lower. Um, and you and I have talked about, we still believe that there's a deflationary impulse to come. But once that happens and the central planners respond, we see a lot of inflation coming. And so I think what we're seeing right now is a little bit of sort of like a priming of the pump where, you know, when, when that big inflationary event happens, people are going to remember this period here where they were, you know, their, their attention was focused on the precious metals. It's just going to be like a 10x or more uh, when this happens in the future. So I kind of look at this as almost like a little preview, a little, little test run. Um, mm -hmm. Curious, what do you think? Well, I absolutely agree. And these whipsaws that were, you know, where it goes one direction and then changes and goes the other direction, uh, these are probably going to become more violent, but they keep everybody off their toes. They just prepare for the last thing that they were worried about. And then the opposite happens and they were unprepared for that. Uh, so it's going to be a very difficult thing to navigate. Uh, but I think, you know, a short term severe deflation uh, followed, but the, and that's exactly what I wrote in my book, the threat of inflation followed by uh, uh, deflation, followed by real inflation, big inflation, or even the potential of hyperinflation. All right. Well, well said. All right. Well, let's get on to the chart of the day. But right before we do, uh, just a reminder, folks, if you're enjoying this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, you can do all that right below the video player here. Um, all right, Mike, getting to the chart of the day, it's really the charts of the day. We're going to talk about an article that was recently released by Lance Roberts, who is an excellent uh, market analyst and, uh, and chartist. Um, and he's just got a whole parade of charts here, um, you know, basically about uh, asset price bubbles, um, a really compelling empirical romp through a bunch of data that says, Hard to disagree that we're seeing asset price bubbles in a lot of places. And the title of his article is Bubbles Last Until They Don't. So um, what are you taking from this article, Mike? I think it's a great article. And I love Lance. He's, he is an excellent analyst. And I uh, refer to his uh, website very often. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Uh, he he's just produces a wealth of information. 
But the first chart, he's got Jeremy Grantham's uh, chart of 40 years, the history of 40 years of price bubbles in the market. And they're showing uh, the gold, the, the precious metals bubble back in the 80s and the uh, Nikkei bubble in the, uh, the late 80s, early 90s. And Thailand, and then uh, there's the tech bubble, the US housing bubble, Chinese bubble, and uh, biotech. And now we've got the almost everything bubble. It's, uh, they called it the everything bubble in, in here, but we're at a, in a bubble that's really the greatest one in history. And uh, it, it can't go on forever. Uh, that's a very interesting chart. Any comments on that from your side? Well, I think uh, on that chart specifically, you know, I just want to point out for folks that this latest bubble just dwarfs everything that's come before it, right? Um, you know, we, we toss out this term "everything bubble," which I've used an awful lot as well. Um, but it, it's it's not just uh, trying to coin a phrase. I mean, when you look at the scope and magnitude of the level of overvaluation right now, um, it's it's historically unprecedented. So we truly are in uncharted waters. Okay. Yeah, the other thing I liked about the article, and, and it, I'm just going to bang through a couple of things here, Mike, and feel mm -hmm. free to stop me. But you know, Lance um, gave empirical data that says, look, you know, here's a lot of reasons why we, we can look at data and say we're in a bubble. But he said, look, you know, bubbles are psychological phenomena, right? It, it's basically a, a period of, of time where emotion trumps logic, right? And people begin believing stories uh, that maybe don't have a rational basis, um, you know, in reality. So um, he kind of delves into the psychology of a bubble, um, and and you know, largely it's it's the swing from from fear up to greed, where everybody is just so greedy they're not paying attention to logic. Um, and you know, he says, okay, well, what what really defines a, a, a mania or an investing mania? And he says you have to have the following five things: you have to have high optimism, uh, easy credit, um, a rush of initial and secondary offerings as companies are capitalizing on these crazy prices. Um, you want to see the, you have to see the riskiest stocks outperforming and you have to see stretched valuations. And then he goes through and says, yeah, we're seeing every one of those exuberance yeah. check. And uh, hopefully our producer, Dan Rubach can put up these charts as I'm talking about it. Um, but he shows, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the market's never been this irrationally exuberant, uh, easy credit and leverage check. Yeah. Borrowing has exploded um, during the past uh, 16 months here. Um, rush of in initial or secondary offerings? Absolutely. Um, and not only are we seeing a rush of new offerings, but we're seeing um, uh, the, <laughs> the highest percentage of unprofitable companies going public than we've ever seen in the past. So basically, all the junk is rushing to sell right now, to, you know, to, to, to sell to the patsies right now. Uh, investing in risky stocks? Check. Uh, looking at this chart, you'll see that top line at the at the very top. Uh, the top five percent most shorted stocks uh, are the ones that are outperforming everything else right now. Uh, that's similar to the fact that uh, junk uh, debt right now is trading lower than the rate of inflation, which is just completely ridiculous. Uh, and then last, uh, stretched valuations. Uh, again, one last chart here. Uh, but showing that, again, we're at uh, a, a period of uh, valuation and overvaluation that we've never been at before in history. So I think Lance does a really good job of just saying, look, if we're trying to take emotion out of the picture and look at this rationally, our dashboard of warning lights is like blinking red everywhere. Oh, it started blinking red several years ago. And now, uh, you know, it's lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, uh, the The... I didn't think it could get this stretched, but it is, you know, when you look at the overvaluations and then that one of the charts is uh, the, how many, you know, it's Google searches for uh, options trading, you know, how to trade options. And <laughs> from, this goes back to 2004. And from 2004, it, it rose from an average uh, on this chart of like nine, and then it went up to 75 in just the past uh, year and a half. And so um, uh, it, it averages nine early in the century, then up to about uh, 12, and then about 15 was the average uh, up to the end of 2019. And then just suddenly 2020, 2021, it's like off the charts by comparison. So it's like uh, five to uh, seven times uh, the number of people searching for that term. 
And that's showing that we should be nearing the end of this bubble when that type of op optimism and uh, risk, people taking on that level of risk uh, becomes so predominant. Yeah, we're near the end. So I think this is a brilliant article. I think everybody should read it. All right. Um, so moving on here, um, we're going to talk about uh, the latest viewer feedback that we received here, Mike. Um, let, me, uh, let me read this to you, and then I'll let you react to it. Um, this is by Thomas Johnson, who writes, the people in government that are old enough to remember the 60s through 80s, 1960s through 1980s, don't care. And we talked about this last week uh, with, with uh, Yumi and Jeff, Mike. Um, they are so out of touch with actual reality that they don't see the issue. Almost all of them grew up with enough privilege to never understand firsthand how any inflation affects the 95% of the country that feel the pain. Seriously, just look at all the policies, bills, et cetera, they write. Read them. It is painfully obvious that they have zero understanding of life outside of the walls of Congress. What say you, Mike? I say that uh, Thomas Johnson, who uh, wrote this, is absolutely correct. I want to thank him. Uh, for bringing that to everybody's attention, because uh, they do live in sort of an ivory tower uh, up there in Congress. And all of these people did grow up with great privilege. They grew up in, in mostly wealthy families. There's a few people uh, in Congress and the Senate that, uh, you know, came from the middle class and so on. But most of these people uh, grew up, uh, you know, with silver spoons in their mouths. So, uh, I think he's absolutely right, and it really hurts the rest of the country to have representation uh, that is so far detached from reality. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think it's the, the tale of, of two countries, basically, right? Um, you know, as we've said often in, in past videos, my belief is, is that we really do have a captured system where the people who have um, been winning the game have reinvested their advantage to you know, back politicians and get the laws and regulations, et cetera, continued to be rewritten to, you know, continue and improve their advantage. And so um, we basically, to a certain extent, have more almost like an oligarchy these days than we do really a true representative democracy. Yes. So, okay. So we're going to go to the memes of the day. Yep. And just before we do, I just want to remind folks, Mike, though, to make sure they download your free book. So um, go to goldsilver.com slash free book. If you haven't read the book yet, folks, it is one of the absolute best, maybe even the absolute best guide on why you want to be protecting your wealth with gold and silver and how to do it. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, there's two memes here and everybody needs to stick around for the second one, but they both refer to Cuba. And what I want to say before this is that, you know, I went to the report on economic freedom and it, it measures uh, the, all of the different countries. Uh, there, there's, I believe, uh, there's close to 170 countries now that they're measuring every year. And they measure all of the countries that produce reliable economic data. Well, <laughs> Cuba isn't on the list because they don't produce reliable economic data, something that you can actually that you put this stuff into a spreadsheet, you hit sort, and the uh, most free market economies that protect property rights and that have a lot of economic freedom where you can start a business easily, run a business easily, import, export, anything you want, they go to the top and those people up in the top quartile uh, live almost, they live more than 15 years. It's like 16 years longer than the people in the bottom quartile. Uh, in some countries, it's more than 20 years. Um, but uh, Cuba doesn't even appear on the list because it, but I went to the, that, that, that's produced by the Fraser Institute up in Canada, which is a moderate think tank. I went to the Heritage Foundation's uh, report on economic freedom, and they do include Cuba, which is right down there with South Korea and Venezuela at the bottom of the yeah. list. <laughs> and I don't usually use them because, uh, you know, somebody that's uh, more liberal will just dismiss that as a conservative think tank and not even look at the data. But so here are the memes. I hope you Cubans know that Bernie Sanders is disappointed in your ungrateful attitude towards free health care and literacy programs. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that's hilarious. <laughs> then the next one is Cuba celebrates 60 years of rent control. And this is these crumbling buildings. It is so true. This is the proof. It's the reason there's the uprising uh, risings in Cuba right now. It's the proof that top-down government control of the economy does not work. It's got to come from the ground up, from people opening up their wallets and voting for what they want in the free market with free enterprise. I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank you, Adam, for moderating this. It was great. It was a pleasure, Mike. Thanks.